I'm Fred Kemp, President and CEO of the Atlantic Council, joining you from Atlantic Council Studios here in Washington, D.C., where I'm excited to kick off today's discussion on the critical role of hydrogen in the global energy transition. Uh, the threat of climate change and the need for bold and rapid climate action have grown increasingly clear over the past few years, and we saw critical action taken last month at COP26 in Glasgow with uh, major companies and economies offering bold visions and commitments for reaching our climate ta targets and deploying critical energy and decarbonizing technologies quickly. The Atlantic Council was there in Glasgow in full force. Uh, one of the technologies that has gathered momentum over the past two years is clean hydrogen, a fuel that can be deployed across a wide variety of industries to help decarbonize and spur the world toward the energy system of the future. I'm delighted to welcome SNAM, Europe's largest pipeline company and global leader on hydrogen technology development and deployment as our partners for this event. We'll hear from Marco Alvera, SNAM's chief executive officer, who has been a global leader on advocating for clean hydrogen. SNAM has been a partner to the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center as they have built out their hydrogen policy sprint and other hydrogen programming aimed at evaluating the opportunities and challenges for hydrogen uh, development and deployment in the United States and beyond. Now, I have to tell you a little bit of a secret, uh, which is that I met with Marco three years ago, and ever since then I've been proselytizing about hydrogen. And I've been telling everybody that if The Graduate, the movie The Graduate was made now with Dustin Hoffman, they wouldn't be telling him to go into plastics, they'd be telling him to go into hydrogen. Uh, so I feel very deeply about this, I'm pretty passionate about it. So today's event is part of the U.S. rollout and launch of Marco's new book, The Hydrogen Revolution, A Blueprint for the Future of Clean Energy, in which he charts the potential role of clean hydrogen in reshaping the energy system and the global economy into a more inclusive and cleaner world. I'm excited to hear more from Marco about his vision and about the importance of hydrogen to meeting our climate commitments, as well as to hear from the panel with me today. So it's my pleasure to welcome to the Council and today's dis discussion, Jillian Ivanko, President and Chief Executive Officer of Chart Industries, uh, Chad Holliday, former Chairman of Royal Dutch Shell, and Dr. Varun Sivaram, uh, Senior Director for Clean Energy and Innovation at the U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate. At this point, I'd like to turn over to my colleague, Randy Bell, uh, who has been having to hear me bend his ear on hydrogen ever since that meeting with Marco three years ago. Uh, Randy is the Director of the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center and the Richard Morningstar Chair for Global Energy Security. So thank you again to all of our speakers and attendees for joining today's important discussion. Randy, over to you. Thank you, Fred. Um, and let me echo our, uh, your thanks to our audience for joining us today, both uh, out uh, virtually and also the group that's here in the room at the Atlanta Council. And also to thank our speakers for joining us and to SNAM for being such a great partner on our work on hydrogen, uh, which has been uh, driven by Fred's proselytizing for the past few years. Um, now, before we get started, just so you know, if you're out in uh, out watching on Zoom, you can ask questions through the, the Q&A function on Zoom. I'm monitoring, monitoring those questions on the iPad, and we'll take them uh, when relevant throughout the conversation. So feel free to ask as they come up. Um, and uh, you, can, uh, you can also uh, ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag hydrogen revolution. Um, I want to start today's discussion by turning to Marco as we're here both to discuss clean hydrogen's important role in the energy transition, something that we really have been focused on here at the Global Energy Center, um, and also to launch Marco's new book, The Hydrogen Revolution, which I have right here, um, and it's fantastic, so I really look, <laughs> recommend it to everybody. Um, so, uh, but Marco, I want to start by asking you broadly, you know, what drove you to write this book, um, and, and really how do you see SNAM as, why did SNAM driving hydrogen, given, you know, given its background? Um, and uh, you know, where do you see the role of hydrogen in a decarbonized energy system? Thanks. Thanks for having me, and thanks for uh, this question. So I uh, was a big hydrogen skeptic when I was working in Enel, the world's largest uh, electricity utility and renewable energy company. I went to Japan. It was 
very expensive. It was $1,000 per megawatt hour. I loved the technology in 2004, but I wrote a note to the government saying it will never work. I checked again in 2010. By then, I had crossed the river from the world of electrons in NL mm -hmm. to the world of molecules in any. And I checked again in 2010, and it was still at 600 dollars per megawatt hour, and oil was at around 50 dollars a megawatt hour. So I still thought it was never going to work. And then a colleague of mine, Camilla, walked into my office one day in 2018. We were looking at a net zero case for Italy in 2050, mm -hmm. and she said there's going to be about 10 or 15 percent of hydrogen in the mix. And I said, you're wrong. No way. It's too expensive. It's mm -hmm. never going to work. And we worked through the maths. Very simple chart that's in the book on page 229. It's the only one page that, that's necessary <laughs> that just says that because solar costs are falling so quickly, and because the electrolyzers that you need to transform the solar energy into hydrogen by splitting up water, that's a, an industry that doesn't exist. So as you scale that up, the costs come down. And, and as I, this is a third book I'm writing because the costs keep falling so right, quickly, right. I have to keep chasing them. And so it's really just a question of price. There's, it's not a political issue. It's not. It's not almost not even an environmental issue. It's. It's. I mean, it. It, it will save uh, the chance of getting to staying below one and a half degrees. Uh, but it's really about delivering in the very near future energy, clean energy that can be used, scaled up, transported, stored at about twenty-five dollars per megawatt hour, which is the Earthshot uh, DOE target for the end of this decade. Right. So. Do you see green hydrogen dropping below the price of gray hydrogen at some point in the you know, in this 2050 time frame? Look, it really depends to uh, which country you're you're mm -hmm. looking at. And uh, in Europe right now, we're spending 99 uh, dollars per megawatt hour to buy gas. So to turn that into gray hydrogen uh, would be even more expensive. And we say we can deliver green hydrogen at 25. If you're sitting in the Barnett, you can probably produce. Uh, methane at twenty dollars a megawatt hour, and so you know you have that five dollar yep. margin to play with to make blue hydrogen. Yeah, so so you see that future. Now we actually had a good question from the audience that follows on this, uh, which is you know what is your definition of clean hydrogen? There's not a consensus on that. So how do you how do you see hydrogen as in a decarbonized world? What sort of colors are, are worth thinking about? That, that is a great question, and there's a lot of debate. We need blue hydrogen, and it needs to be defined as a hydrogen that has almost zero methane emissions in it, and it has very high carbon capture. Uh, Germany and the UK are probably going to lead the way in setting that standard somewhere in 2022 mm -hmm. because Germany is desperately uh, urgent to need to import hydrogen urgently. And the UK wants to import from Norway blue hydrogen as well. So I suspect the standard will, will shape itself up in the coming months and it will be just a, a, a kind of grams of CO2 equivalent emissions in the whole right. value chain. That's yep. how it's going to happen. Got it. That, that, and that's crucial to getting, getting this piece that, of it that's, right. That's yeah. the only way we're going to get a market uh, going. And then if you add on top of that carbon border adjustments for Europe, mm -hmm. that will then in, inevitably turn into steel and manufacturing. So it will yep. start as a standard and it will then filter out into the bigger yeah. industry. Now, you were saying earlier you were in Japan in, I think, 2004. Yeah. There was a sort of hydrogen moment then, uh, right around then as well. Everyone thought you know, hydrogen is the fuel of the future. Um, obviously, that did not happen, um, though, though the price has come down since then. Why do you think this is the moment right now? It's just prices. And I used to think solar would never go below $10 a megawatt hour. I thought it would plateau at around 100. It was starting at 1,000. And now it's at 10. And it's going to continue to lower. So when you have uh, nuclear at 100, the electricity you're paying here in the studio is at $300 a megawatt hour, and you have solar at 10. You know, it's all about turning that solar into something we can use in yep. trucks and factories and different time zones, et cetera. Right. Um, well, Marco, thank you. Um, I want to turn to the panel now, um, and we're going to come back to the book and to a number of the questions, but I uh, want, to, want to bring everyone in for this conversation. Um, so first, I want to go to Jill. Um, and Jill, hear your perspective on the emergence of, of hydrogen and the sort of conversation about hydrogen in the United States. Really, over the past year or 18 months, it's all of a sudden become the, uh, the topic that people are, are, are sort of questioning, are talking about, fighting about. Um, there's, uh, there's hydrogen wars online, on Twitter, et cetera. So love to hear your conversation, your, your things thought about that, and the momentum we've seen coming uh, on hydrogen coming out of COP26. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I always tell the story. In 2018, I talked about hydrogen on my earnings call, and no one cared. 
So <laughs> all of a sudden in 2020, it became really relevant. Um, we've been manufacturing hydrogen equipment for over 50 years. And what we're seeing is the conversation turning, as Marcus said, much more practical. So 18 months ago, you were talking about everything was going to be green. But economically, you couldn't really get there. In the United States, what we've seen is a move toward the right applications utilizing hydrogen. And we're also seeing that infrastructure and the network start to come together so that the cost continues to be driven down. And when I talk about the right application, it's really, um, in some cases, hydrogen doesn't make sense. And in other cases, it really does. So for example, liquid, hydro liquid hydrogen, you're talking about um, heavy duty transport and above. It doesn't make sense for passenger vehicles. So now that conversation is starting to turn practical. Mm -hmm. And in turn, you're getting a more effective cost and scale. And so we're seeing that really accelerate over the last nine months. And we've seen that in, uh, in the order book as well. That's fantastic. Now, what type of policies would actually help accelerate the trends that you're already seeing from the uh, private sector? Yeah, that's definitely, um, you know, it, as Marco alluded to, like now is a time because you're talking about price. But there's also an exceptional amount of interest in the public and the private sector, which is far different than it used to be. And I call it peer pressure. You know, you're not the, you know, there's no company out there that's not talking about hydrogen. So um, accelerating that through, uh, I would say, government stimulus slash credit programs, as long as it's a universal versus a state specific approach is really important. <coughs> But I also think it's really important that we talk about this as we have to eventually get off of relying on public sector funding mm -hmm. or public sector credit programs, because otherwise it's just not going to be a sustainable industry. Um, but definitely a credit program that's a universal one, as well as support for uh, the certifications. So in our business, you know, we, safety is really important and certifications are critical and right now they're at a very regional level. So this cannot become a global economy until we start figuring that out as well. So funding, credits, and then standards. Yep, fantastic. Um, I want to turn now to Varun. Uh, now we, we were talking about policy, now that Jill sort of talked about domestic, you work on the international side, but is there an opportunity um, for international collaboration, particularly between uh, the U.S. and Europe um, on, on hydrogen. And could that accelerate the hydrogen deployment here in, in the United States? Sure. Well, well thanks, Randy, and th thanks for having me. Congratulations to, to Marco on the great book. Um, I, read, I read a preprint, and it was terrific. Uh, look, one observation from um, Secretary Kerry's travels around the world, and he's visited you know, so many countries, he's probably traveled around the world 10 times in the last year, is that one topic recurrently comes up and is always positively framed, and it's hydrogen. It's the topic that we can collaborate on with, as you said, the European Union. We just launched a Germany dialogue, and that's in it. We have a US-India uh, hydrogen task force. So there's a range of ways in which hydrogen has become this linchpin of international collaboration. It's, it's something we all agree on is, is critical. Let's, let's back up and, and be clear. Um, the, the number one tool we have in decarbonization is, is electrification. Right? Roughly two-thirds of final energy demand in a net zero world should be electrified. Mm -hmm. um, but that 18% or so that could come from hydrogen in a net zero world, uh, that's the Energy Transition Commission's number, others will have different numbers. Look, we're not going to be able to get away from, as Marco said, using molecules. And so therefore the Biden administration has made hydrogen a clear priority, both in, as, as you were mentioning, our domestic investments and also our international collaboration. Domestically, the bipartisan infrastructure bill devotes billions of dollars for hydrogen demonstration projects. The Department of Energy has an Earthshots program to drive the cost down to a dollar a kilogram by 2030. Internationally, uh, in terms of hydrogen, we have the Mission Innovation Hydrogen Mission, um, as well as all of these hydrogen partnerships that we just talked about. So the key thing now is, moving forward, how are we going to collaborate both with other governments as well as with the private sector, and I hope we get to that, Randy, to ensure that hydrogen not only is top of mind, but that it actually gets used in the sectors that need it most. As Jill said, those sectors are gonna be the hard to abate sectors, mm -hmm. the heavy industry, 
the long distance transportation sectors. Got it. Well, um, since you mentioned the private sector, why don't we talk a little bit about the First Movers Coalition, which was recently launched, uh, that it aims to uh, work on decarbonized steel, trucking, aviation, shipping, really these hard, hard to abate sectors. Um, how does hydrogen play a role in the First Movers Coalition and how the Biden administration thinks about that, that, set, of sec that set of companies and sectors? Well, I appreciate you bringing it up. Um, for Secretary Kerry, President Biden, the First Movers Coalition was a signature U.S. launched initiative at COP26. And what it did was bring together companies from around the world, $6 trillion in market value, 34 companies, that all pledged to make purchase commitments this decade in 20, uh, by 2030 for technologies that aren't yet on the market but that we'll need for net zero by 2050 in these what we call need to abate or hard to abate sectors, steel, trucking, shipping, mm -hmm. aviation, a range of other ones. In almost all these sectors, hydrogen could very well play a role. You saw the world's first fossil-free steel shipment in August 2021. It used a direct reduction by hydrogen process. Now we need to scale it up such that companies like Volvo, one of our first movers, can meet their 10% commitment by 2030. The 10% of their steel for their vehicles will come from near zero carbon steel. Again, we're not talking about incremental improvements. What hydrogen enables is breakthrough disruptive improvements that help you get the GHG emissions from these sectors down to zero or near zero. In aviation, for example, we'll need technologies, not just today's generation of sustainable aviation fuels, but tomorrow's generation of fuels that reduce our emissions by 85% or more. That's why United Airlines, Delta, Boeing, Salesforce, Apple, and others have committed to reduce 5% of their conventional jet fuel demand with these technologies that reduce emissions 85% or more. They'll have to use hydrogen, mm -hmm. likely, for some of that. Because hydrogen can be combined. You produce green hydrogen, you combine it with captured carbon dioxide, and you can produce synthetic fuels that are one of the only ways to reduce your emissions close to zero in the aviation sector. So we're very excited for the First Movers Coalition and this private sector innovation that invariably will involve hydrogen in many applications. Varun, thanks so much, and thanks for the work that you're doing on, on First Movers. It's really, really impressive. Okay, let's go to Chad for a second here. Now, Chad, you were, uh, recently served as the chairman of the board of Shell. You also were the CEO of DuPont. Um, both have a, obviously have a, a huge play in hydrogen. Um, from your perspective, is the, the conversation about hydrogen right now uh, a long time coming? Um, ha, ha, is, or is this um, is the same thing that's been happening for the past 20, 30 years? Um, do, do, you see, do you see a difference now? So let me give you one story from 20 years ago, picking up Mar Marco's uh, history <laughs> stories. And then I would like to build on the First Movers Coalition with something called Mission Possible Partnership. Yep. But I, I would call sitting here today, for those on, on the line, we're just off K Street. And I was riding down K Street in the back seat of an all hydrogen vehicle uh, with my uh, co rider was Dr. Toyota. He's got the little car company in, in, in Japan. And there's a police car in front, a police car in back, because we certainly weren't street legal at that point in time. We got to the press conference after it was over, and they asked Dr. Toyota, How much does this car cost? And he answered very clearly in English, $20,000, and had a pause. And they looked up at him like, Oh, the car costs twenty thousand. The fuel cell costs two million. We got to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> so the Mirai is out today. They got the cost out. Okay, but but I, I think it's moving. But if you'd ask us that day, would the electric powered cars on the road today be hydrogen or they'd be battery electric? We would have said hydrogen. And, and I think in the larger vehicles, that will still turn out to be the case. But there's, there's a bit of history here. We're coming down a cost curve. Mm -hmm. I think hydrogen has hit its point in time. Now, let, let me pitch my Mission Parcel Possible Partnership, which is sponsored by the Energy Transition Commission, which, which I'm a member of. Uh, Bezos Earth Fund, uh, uh, Bill Gates Breakthrough Energy, World Economic Forum, et cetera. We're looking at those seven sectors you talked about, uh, steel, aluminum, chemicals, and cement. And, and ships, planes, and, tr and uh, 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 ships, trains, and trucks. Uh, and what we find, if you look at our website, you will see we have an in-depth study working with every co companies to do that. Hydrogen comes up in every one. Well, hydrogen be, and that's the only technology that if you look across all seven of those segments, it's there. It, it doesn't necessarily say it will be the winner, but I think it will be a niche player in all, all seven of those. So I want to ask you a question about demand and, and um, the sort of chicken or egg question. Is there enough demand for, for clean hydrogen versus is there enough supply? So you both with Shell and DuPont, 
um, both companies, major consumers of gray hydrogen. Um, there's a huge market for gray hydrogen right now, 90, 100 million tons a year, primarily used in refining, used in chemicals as a feedstock, and used in fertilizers. Is there a way of using that current demand, uh, that, that pretty significant demand, a large source of emissions, to, um, to shape the demand for clean hydrogen instead of thinking first about green steel, uh, about transportation, going where the demand already is instead of moving, jumping ahead? Or do we need to jump ahead because the, the other industries just won't, won't get there in time? So when I was riding down the road with Dr. Toyota, it was because I was with DuPont, and right, we, were making right. the, we were making the membrane for the fuel cell uh, uh, and, and to make that possible. I, I think my simple answer to your question is all of the above. Uh, we, we need to expand gray so we'll make the whole system work, and we can do that today. Because we were talking gray hydrogen at that point in time. Yep. Yeah, because uh, we were nowhere close to the cost points yep, that we yep, had at point in time. Of course. Blue hydrogen plays a role, but, but ultimately green hydrogen from electrolysis is going to be the ultimate answer. Got it. And do you think it'll go in, you know, can, can you set a demand signal from the fertilizer industry, from the chemical industry, to say, we want to be buying green hydrogen, we're buying gray now? It's a very faint signal. It's kind of hard to hear from here. Yeah. You know, it, it really is. It, it's just not enough economic driver yet. We still need some more economic, the, the government or somebody needs to put a little more push. But I think the momentum is going so well with a little more push. I, I know Ernie Monus used to say a nudge. Yep. You know, a real hard nudge could probably move this right now. Got it. And we could probably sell some more books doing that too. So. <laughs> Buy your book online. Um, now, so let's go back to Marco. So Marco, if you want to make a plug for your book, uh, you feel free at any time. Um, I want to talk about the COP. Um, we, were, we were all yeah. there. Um, and as we all said, hydrogen was talked about constantly in many different contexts, um, including by Special Envoy Kerry multiple times. Um, and is, is it, uh, do you, what do you see as the big outcomes from the COP when it comes to hydrogen? I think COP is, it has been vital to keep one and a half degrees on, on the lifeline. And that was only possible because uh, the teams negotiated a, a, a kind of a net zero commitment from India and negotiated this phasing down of coal. And that's the only chance we have. Um, but in COP, we must register a big divide between the ambition that was really upped and the action, which is mm -hmm. kind of where it is, because it takes 10 years to build these projects. And so it's great to have the first movers committing to 2030 targets. It's great to have the mission possible. I'm chair of the Green Hydrogen Catapult. We're all trying to do the same things and defining 2030 targets. But what really matters is what we do in 2022, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. We need to get to 27 with real projects already built. Now, if you backward engineer that, it means we, start, we should have started building them you know, three years ago. So we need to really accelerate the delivery capacity of the industry, which is traditionally uh, a kind of a, a steady-paced, uh, reliable industry, but not a fast industry. We need to apply West Coast mentality to the energy sector. We need to really accelerate this. And there's a lot of synergies between these different coalitions to sitting down together and saying, OK, Amazon, they said they want to do this by 2030. How much hydrogen can I deliver to them in 2025? And that will trigger my investment decision to start building that. So we announced on Monday a $25 billion CapEx program to move hydrogen from North Africa to Central Europe. We've announced that. We've mm -hmm. taken the commitment. We're upgrading the pipelines. We've also announced that you can store hydrogen in the existing gas storage reservoirs. Mm -hmm. That's a huge game changer yep. for the whole of the industry because it's breaking the big chicken and egg dilemma but saying, okay, the biggest problem, which is the midstream infrastructure, it's already there. The demand, we can build it up overnight with some blending of hydrogen in, yep. in the methane grid. And, and we have all these very uh, important commitments that have been achieved for 2030, 2040, 2070 in the case of India. But what really matters to stay below one and a half degrees is what happens in the next five years. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to get there with a the business as usual approach. Got it. Now, you, you mentioned North Africa. We have a really interesting question from the audience. That, we'll go to Marco first, but if anyone else wants to chime in as well. Um, this is from uh, Karen uh, Monahan. Um, there, she says that there's a lot of talk about sourcing hydrogen in Africa, um, and, and you're, you're doing so. But, and so in exporting green hydrogen to industrialized countries. But also, most African countries have an energy poverty issue and, and an electrification issue. Is there a conflict? between asking for production of green hydrogen, so building up you know, so solar wind in certain cases, um, and then using that for producing hydrogen instead of producing electricity to be used domestically. 
to, to the contrary, as Varun said, uh, hydrogen will be a huge diplomatic smoother of geopolitical tensions. And 0.8% of the Sahara would generate enough sun for the whole of Europe. <laughs> right, right. Okay? And so what we need to add to this question is that we will have 2 billion people joining the world in sub-Saharan Africa, mm -hmm. mainly. 70% of every new child is born in sub-Saharan Africa. So that energy poverty, that lack of access to, to, to reliable uh, energy is going to increase significantly. So the Saharan belt, if we fast-track the development to satisfy European urgent demand, we're also at the same time fast-tracking a solution for sub-Saharan Africa. So let me dig a little deeper on this. If you're talking, you know, you can only build so many projects a year. If you're talking about building, uh, you know, utility scale solar, solar farm in North Africa, or, um, or uh, you know, we had um, uh, the energy minister from Namibia here in, in, uh, in September talking about their big hydrogen ambitions, which is a, 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 wind pro a bunch of wind, wind projects. Um, if you're building those and then using, converting it to hydrogen instead of electrifying, so just in terms of sequencing, should we be building and electrifying those countries first, or should we be building hydrogen uh, for Western use first? It, it's, it's like Chad said, it's, it's all of the above. <clears throat> I mean, we're, we're in a race, we're in a war to stay below one and a half degrees. Mm -hmm. Every basis point matters, so it's, it's kind of a war that's worth fighting continuously. And you need electrification. Wherever you can do direct electrification, it has and should be electrified. Uh, and we're going to need a lot of molecules as well. So really, it's, uh, the, the bottleneck will become the people. The capital is there. We heard the GFANS, $130 trillion. Uh, the capital is there. The need is there. The technology is there. We need people. And we need people to work smarter, to work faster. Because as I said, you know, Amazon can build a, a depot in, in six months. Right. And, and you know, we would, SNAP would traditionally take a project from concept to steel in like 10 years. So we need that approach, uh, which, which means a lot of new startups, a lot of new jobs, uh, but the bottleneck will be the people. That's why universities are important, to start training the right people uh, for, for these new jobs, which will be a lot about system integration, a lot about understanding both the molecules and the electrons, a lot about storage solutions. Mm -hmm. Any, anybody else want to chime in on that question? Um, doesn't, doesn't look like it. So uh, let's move on. Um, I, oh, Chad? Yep. Look. look uh, I had the honor for five years to chair something called Sustainable Energy for All mm -hmm. with Conde Yumkela from Sierra Leone, from Africa. Uh, I learned so much more about Africa my five years with him than I could ever get out of a textbook or read from something else. Whatever we do in Africa, talk to some people who live there and make sure we understand what's going on. Us don't think we're smarter than them. They're pretty smart folks and, and know what's right. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that. Um, I want to go to the question that uh, Jill touched on at the beginning, and I think we've all sort of touched on it, which is where is the, the use case for hydrogen? Uh, it's been, hydrogen's been described as a Swiss Army knife. We've talked a lot about how it was initially used uh, in, in passenger vehicles, so the fuel cell was $2 million. Um, uh, so there's, there's a lot of potential use cases, um, but the amount of hydrogen necessary to go into any one of those use cases globally could sort of you know, be, you know, I think the, the, the figure we like to use is that if you want to just replace the current uh, uh, gray hydrogen demand, you need all of the installed renewable capacity as of the end of 2019. So you can't use hydrogen everywhere. Where should we be thinking first? And Varun, you wanted to jump in on that. You make a really good point, which is um, when we talk about technology adoption, we have some examples from other fields that suggest to us that what you're really looking for initially are these niche markets that allow you to have premium pricing for that product. So look at solar panels. Um, major utility scale 100 megawatt farms are not how we initially scaled up solar. Mm. Solar was out in the outback in Australia. Uh, you had solar panels on satellites where you were far less price sensitive mm -hmm. on offshore oil platforms. And eventually we started to get to today's use cases. Light emitting diodes, LED lights, which are you know in, in this room right now, I'm looking at one. Um, they didn't start as indoor or outdoor lighting. They started as electronic displays. Niche stepping stone markets are how a technology gains the maturity and the cost reductions that then allow it to colonize the larger markets. In the cases of hydrogen, therefore, um, uh, it's, it's important to find those applications where you can actually charge a premium price for the initially too expensive hydrogen. I want to make one more sort of provocative point, if you'll permit me. Um, Please. We just heard from Marco, um, uh, almost in passing, the technology is there. It's not obvious to me that the technology that we will want to produce and use hydrogen in 2050 is in fact there right now. 
It, maybe it is. Maybe it is the case that the alkaline electrolyzer or the PEM electrolyzer that we have today is what we will scale up and through economies of scale and learning the cost will come down and that in 2050 will enable us to decarbonize steel and aviation, etc. But maybe not. And I think there's still right now a lot of opportunity for technology ferment. It may be the case that this Heliogen Bloom Energy Partnership where you have uh, high temperature solar thermal producing electrolysis at a higher efficiency. Mm -hmm. By the way, nuclear can do that too. Or next generation electrolyzer technologies or even an integrated device, a photoelectrochemical cell that takes solar energy and in one device splits water and produces hydrogen immediately. Maybe those are the technologies in 2050 that we will use. Today, should we presuppose that we already have the technology we need? I'm not so sure. So, Marco, you said yeah. your name, so you get to respond. Yeah, no, I, I, I love this point. Um, I always say building a hydrogen road from North Africa to Germany, it's like the building a Roman road 2,000 years ago. So the technology has changed, but in Italy, we're still riding on the same road. So we're going to get some better panels, we're going to get better electrolyzers, we're going to get different ways. But once I bring the sun to a factory, that route, that kind of macro technology is not a transition technology. That's kind of the end game, if you see what I mean. Uh, so that's when I say technology. Then we'll continue to be smarter and cheaper and faster and better. But opening up those uh, routes, I mean, that's the biggest business opportunity the moder modern world has seen, frankly, because yeah. it's about building perennial infrastructure. And we're on a rush to do it, and the capital's there, and the interest rates are low. So it will be about people. So we've got some great follow-up questions for both of you, but I do, I know, Jill, you're looking like you want to say something. No, I would just, uh, I agree with Varun. Like, well, one of the things that we do is invest in multiple different kind of startup technologies. And for us, it really comes back to the molecule. So the end use being uh, an end user that's in vitamin production, they, they want to be clean, so hydrogen is important, but they also want acetylene to make their vitamins, to make their product, right? So if you think about the market and the industry and you say, what does the end customer want? You know, I think concrete and cement, right? They, that makes sense for them to do carbon capture because they use CO2 in their product, right? So that hits home to the actual application. Um, the other thing I would point out to your original question is, um, what are we seeing right now? And, at the end of the day, we're not going to rip out all existing infrastructure. We're not going to rip out everything that currently is diesel or oil. So how do you incorporate making that hydrogen ready? And that's a lot of the work that we're hearing from people putting new facilities in. Mm -hmm. They're going to do LNG facilities, but how do I make it hydrogen ready? Mm -hmm. So being able to accommodate that's going to be a key part of what everybody's talking about. Chad. The, the Energy Transition Commission report that came out in April talks about many different uses to answer your question. Mm -hmm. Balancing the grid is number one, number two, and number three. Yep. Yeah. And now, you don't want to go through hydrogen if you don't have to, if you can use it directly. But it looks like that will be key in advancing the grid. The technology is here today. We need to put it to work. So it seems like there's just a lot of different technologies. We've talked about that. I mean, it's the Swiss Army knife. And so prioritizing is going to be really important. But you can have the government prioritize, the market prioritize. We've got to figure out a balance to that to make sure that we don't spend money on something that ultimately is not to be not the right way, not right way forward with, with hydrogen. So we have to figure out a way of getting the market to decide that, but also ask, ask these tough questions because we, can't, we don't have enough hydrogen. I want to follow up to something Marco said from a question in the audience about infrastructure. And maybe you can just clarify this for, because I think there's a lot of misinformation or um, uh, uh, just sort of wrong information out there, but about the constraints of current pipelines. What can we use? What needs to be updated? What can't we use? There's a, uh, you know, questions about embrittlement, et cetera. So we, we operate the pipeline system in Italy, in Greece, in the south of France, in Austria, in the UK, in Belgium. So we, and in, we're shareholders in Abu Dhabi as well. So we have a, a big understanding of different qualities. If we were to build a brand new hydrogen pipe, there's 6,000 miles already of hydrogen mm -hmm. pipes around the world. We would build it with the same exact specs with which we built our pipeline starting 40 years ago. So we've inspected- 40 years ago. 40 years ago. Got it. So we've inspected all our pipeline network in Italy, and we've reached a conclusion that 99% of that can transport 100% hydrogen without any changes to the pipe. Then we need to change the compressor stations above, but that's like the software, that's like the, the app on, on yeah, the phone. Yeah. Um, and, and what I said earlier, we've done the same for storage. So the cap rock in our reservoir for storage is, uh, is impermeable to hydrogen at high pressure, which is a big breakthrough, because suddenly it means we have trillions of dollars of potential replacement costs that's taken out 
of, of the energy uh, transition. Uh, so uh, that's because the steel is soft. That's because methane is CH4, and the embrittlement happens when the loose atom of hydrogen, not the molecule of hydrogen, the loose atom can kind of find its way into the steel. So that's why even with methane, we were building kind of soft quality steel. Um, now, there are some pipes in Italy, 1%, in the US, more, mm -hmm. that have to be replaced because they're built with steel that's too hard. It's like if a, if a stone hits the windshield of a car, it would crack. That's embrittlement. If the, the, the windshield was made with rubber, it wouldn't break anything, right? That's, that's how yep. you should think about Got it. it. And we have not done comprehensively the work in the United States to know which pipes need to be replaced and which pipes. No, but it, you know, it, it's really easy because it's just about the quality of the steel yeah. and 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 the soldering that, that was used to connect the different pipes. Got it. Um, I want to go to Varun. We've got a question from uh, Tisha Schuller in the audience. So, how do you balance the need for these niche markets, these high-end niche markets that can afford the price, um, and to, which which will help generate the scale, with the need to scale? quickly. The, the urgency of the scaling suggests that perhaps these niche markets might not be enough. Well, look, I, um, first of all, you're absolutely right. Critically urgent that we start to get hydrogen into the system. There are kind of no regrets moves we can take right now, right? It's critical that we develop standards for certification. It's critical that we start to build muscles around how does one use green hydrogen in these applications like clean steel. So some no regrets moves. That said, um, there is, of course, a risk that if you scale up a technology today super, super quickly, you make it more difficult for the technology of tomorrow to eventually break into the market. So it's just important that we're aware of that. Um, I also just want to come back to the last point, Chad, you made, Randy, you made. Look, we may be able to sit here and say, with fairly high confidence based on the efficiency of these molecules, we know that hydrogen should be used as a top priority in you know, clean steel or, or aviation, synthetic fuels, right? Um, and as a, as a fairly low priority in passenger vehicles. And, and there are a bunch of other applications that sit somewhere in the middle. Michael Liebrich has a nice chart on this. Um, balancing the grid, for example, some say it's a critical application. Others say this is a, a terrible application because it's so the round trip efficiency of producing hydrogen is, is, is not very high. Um, I do, however, think that there's a danger in right now trying to say, we know exactly where hydrogen needs to and doesn't need to be used, and therefore, we're going to presuppose all of those applications. We will have to let the market decide some of this. Um, and the niche markets where hydrogen is initially scaled up may ultimately not be the markets where hydrogen finds its large-scale net zero use. And that, I bring back the examples of solar in the outback or on offshore oil platforms or satellites. Like, th those are very different markets from where solar is today. But those markets were critical for it to scale up, again, because there were premium prices that you could pay to drive down the cost in those early deployments. Do you think there's some markets where we'll see hydrogen used now, but not in 10 years, but that, that market helps accelerate yeah, the I'll, demand? I'll, I'll give you examples. Um, we, you know, we, we were in Saudi Arabia, um, and Secretary Kerry was speaking with, uh, with his counterparts there about the future of clean hydrogen. And they're building this five gigawatt facility in Neom to produce mm -hmm. green hydrogen. And they're looking to uh, export it to markets where they can get premium prices. And that includes, for example, Germany, potentially for passenger vehicles. Or um, th th there's a small set of markets where they can try and get large premium prices. Those may not be the markets where um, passenger vehicles, for example, you may not have that market in 2050 for hydrogen. It's neither particularly useful in that application, nor will you get the price you need. And so that's an example of the non-linearity here. You may see hydrogen scale up in a different application from where it's really needed for net zero and where it will have large-scale deployment in 2050. Really interesting. Anybody else want to comment on that in particular? Yeah, I, ju I just want to say it's uh, on, the, on the round trip, it's true, it's, it's inefficient. But when you think that this power, this, this LED is, is costing you 300 and, and you can get solar at 10, there's a lot of room between the two. Uh, to, to deal with the energy thermodynamic inefficiency. Uh, and in the UK, when there's no wind, the power prices go to $2,000 uh, per megawatt hour. So I suspect there will be, like Chad was saying, a, a lot of uses to stabilize the grids, which, which are known to be very fragile, especially when there's storms, when there's extreme weather events, and, and we've, we all know what happens to uh, electricity grids when, when the load gets, gets really uh, too much. Yeah, Chad. But, but I think if we could give a stronger policy signal, 
about what, because look at steel. So look at our report on steel. It's one of our most advanced industries. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of little things you can do on the edges, but they're on the edges. You either got to put some kind of additional cost on carbon than what we have today, or you got to make a rule that everything you build in the future has got to be totally green. And then you'll eventually get there. You'll get there in different ways at different points in time. But without some policy intervention, it's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So, so we, I think we have to, in some places, that's just reality. We have to deal with it. Well, so, just to add to say, in Europe where we have carbon pricing, the steel guys are rushing to ask us for hydrogen and, and for CCS. So it's true. It's yeah. true. So, Chad, what, what policy would you like to see? What's the policy that would make this happen the fastest here in the United States? So we're in the process right now of working with all the steel companies to answer that question, so I don't yep. want to speak for them. Okay. Yeah, you need to put a price on carbon, though. <laughs> I think we all agree <laughs> that price on carbon would be helpful. So let's take price on carbon off the table because it doesn't, it's really important, but it won't solve every problem. So after we put a price on carbon, what is the next policy? Or a oh, different way of framing that question, in the United States, let's say we don't get a price on carbon, which seems you know, very likely. What is the policy that you'd like to see, presuming that we don't have a price on carbon? And, and Varun, we'll go to you first, just because you're, you're, you're in this game. Well, why don't I frame my answer in terms of what has worked in the past in other industries and this one, um, very not to presuppose where, um, where legislation will go. But, but I will say, look, between the bipartisan infrastructure bill that has passed and the Build Back Better Act, which uh, uh, you know, is, is currently being debated and, and which has a lot of the president's priorities, um, there are a lot of policies that could support hydrogen. They come from both the supply push side and the demand pull side. Supply push side, you have investments in infrastructure, both in hydrogen production demonstration, but also the associated value chain. You have investments in research and development for the next generation of technologies we were just talking about. To Chad's point, there are also demand pull policies that are important. Um, in other fields, for example, public procurement uh, that's targeted toward innovation has succeeded in bringing innovations out of the market. So vaccines came about thanks in part due to public procurement targeted at innovative new technologies. Similarly, commercial space flight. So public procurement can play a role um, as well as can you know, tax credits and incentives for, for hydrogen. So um, again, I don't want to presuppose any policy, um, but the, the administration has been clear and the president's been clear that the policies across the full value chain um, from the supply push, research, development, demonstration, through deployment and the supply uh, demand pull side, that whole suite is necessary uh, to bring hydrogen to scale. Jill, what are your thoughts? What's the policy we need? Yeah, and my thoughts are just because I talk to customers every day, yep. so it's really around um, more of the incentive side versus a penalty. And you know, listen, my, my customers say, I I'm not going to do it if it's not economical for me. Mm -hmm. And that's fundamentally you know, capitalism. And that's what we have to try to address is how do you get them to make a move so that it makes sense for their business? I mean, these are not, I, I, this isn't a consumer discussion. This is a, a company discussion. Yep. So I think it's more around that. But I would, you know, personally, I would concur that it's the suite of activities that will work together to drive this forward. But if there was one, it would be uh, a credit type of system. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Chad, what are, your, what are your thoughts? What policy outside the carbon tax, which you've already said is necessary? Well, look, look first, I think the infrastructure bill and the bill back, th these, these are great moves, you know, very positive. And there's still room to shape how it's spent. And you've got great capability inside our national labs. But if you could put some of that money toward bringing the cost down on these systems, working with companies, public-private partnerships, whatever makes sense, big opportunity. So we, we just salute what you've done. And now the proof is in the implementation of it. And Marco? So I think we need to define standards as soon as possible. This is both safety standards but quality standards for what blue means and what yeah. clean hydrogen is. And as I said, Germany is probably going to lead the way. UK. In a, with a sense of urgency, but because Europe and the U.S. will continue to trade, as Europe thinks about its carbon border adjustments, that will create an indirect form of, of, <laughs> of, of carbon pricing. But I think what we were saying before, investing on technology, but starting with the supply side. So what happened with solar? The reason solar went from 1,000 to 10 is because four uh, very disruptive leaders in Italy, Spain, U.K., and Germany decided to subsidize solar panels at $1,000 per megawatt hour. This put a trillion euros of subsidies on consumers, which is a very unfair and regressive form of taxation because you're hitting the poorest disproportionately a lot more. This resulted in 12 factories being built in China for the cost of 
maybe $300 million each. So you have 1,000 billion euros spent, you have 5 billion uh, infrastructure build in China, bringing the cost from 1,000 to 10. Now what we're trying to do is build this factory in Italy and build this factory hopefully in the US and get government support to do that. So you start with the end in mind, you're creating jobs, you're keeping the technology. And if you, if you upfront that investment to lower the manufacturing costs of these electrolyzers, then you've essentially have a, a huge multiplier effect on lowering the cost of the entire energy transition or the green premium, as some people would say. Got it. Okay, we have a really good question in the audience from Mark uh, Zashin, which is for Chad, which is a, a question about oil companies. So really mm -hmm. using your experience from, work, from, from being the chairman of Shell. Um, so how much should oil and gas companies, uh, how, what, what role should they be playing in this? And what percentage of their portfolio should be invested in, in, play, in working in the hydrogen space? And it's not gonna be the same for, for every company, but do you see that as, as sort of crucial for, um, for them continuing to play a role in, uh, into the energy transition? I, I think the answer would be for oil and gas companies the same I ask for any company. What are they really good at? What are their capabilities and how do you deploy it? So uh, a lot of oil and gas companies are a lot on the gas side. They know a lot about moving gases through pipelines mm -hmm. and ships and stuff. Use them to do that. And, and so clearly, I think Shell can, I think Total can, I think there's a, a number of companies that can play a role in that. Push them toward using what they're good at. Don't push them to getting in the electricity business with what they're not good at. And, and so, so the, the pressure from investors, the pressure from governments should keep moving them in that direction. And I think a, they can real, add real value to the system. So I want to follow up to that. Um, we got another question from the audience. It's the question that we, you know, we get all the time and you ask hydrogen, uh, have a hydrogen conversation and you talk about blue hydrogen, which is, you know, is, is blue hydrogen jo not just an excuse for keeping oil and gas companies around? Um, now, it's, it's a really good question to ask you with your, from your perspective. Do you see this uh, blue hydrogen? We've, we've talked about how, how it's crucial, how we're not going to get there without blue hydrogen. But how do you square that with some of the concerns about uh, oil and gas companies moving into the, f into the future? Well, blue, we're just trying to talk about how, how do you get to less greenhouse gases emitted. So I wouldn't take anything off the table of how to get there. I, I know there's talk that uh, the, the PR of an oil and gas company is all around blue hydrogen is a reason to stay around. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's, I don't think that's the right question. The right question is, is what can they add value to, coming back to what, what mm -hmm. I said before. I think that's very critical what we're doing. That, that's, um, that's really important. So you have, you have oil and gas companies playing a role in this hydrogen space. You can't, <coughs> you can't do it without them. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so, let, let me, I was with our, our, our LNG folks uh, calling on one of the major uh, marine companies, you know, because I happen mm -hmm. to know the CEO. Mm -hmm. He brought me as a sales rep. And so we were trying to sell LNG, and we, we did sell four ships, so good, I was good. very happy with that. Uh -huh. but all he wanted to talk about was hydrogen. We, what about hydrogen? What about ammonia? That's where I want to be in the future. And, and that, I came away from that saying, we have got to respond to that customer's need because he wants it. Because in this particular marine application, that was really critical to him. That's, that's really fascinating. So, so Marco, uh, obviously, you're a gas transmission company, pipelines. Um, how do you see that question um, particularly play out in Europe, where it's more controversial than it is here? How do you, how do you see that question? How do you respond to it? Um, obviously, we, we, all, we know, we've, we've talked about how, how this works, but how do you think through that challenge that you get? Like, I'm, I, I fully agree with Chad. I mean, we, it's an all-hands-on-deck situation. We need everything that works. What I'm most concerned about is the follow-on to that question, which is CCS. Yep. And a lot of the NGOs are, are blocking CCS or against CCS or lobbying against CCS because they see it as a way of greenwashing mm -hmm. and keeping the oil companies alive. But n there's no energy scenario that gets us to zero without CCS. And CCS is a precursor to direct air capture as mm -hmm. well. Uh, and it's safe, it's tried, it's tested, it's scalable, it's big. So where, where I get nervous is when I see good technologies being yeah. kind of uh, made more difficult uh, for the wrong reasons. But this is why you need standards. Uh, you need Absolutely. methane standards, but you need the carbon capture it's standards. Not, it's not so. going to be easy to build these standards. There's so many competing interests around these standards. But the good thing about a standard is that you can always improve it, like the ISO. Yep. You can go up and up and up mm -hmm. and up. So I'm a big fan of just setting a standard, even if some people aren't happy. And once you have that, it's really easy to work around that, to Got work it. with that to, to make it tighter. Got it. Got it. Uh, Jill, you want to chime in on this? I 100% agree. <laughs> <laughs> Varun? I'm with you. 
<laughs> Excellent. Um, okay, so a another question back to the uh, back to the electrolyzer efficiency question, which has which we we talked about a little bit, but I think it was just worth clarifying. Um, we, uh, which is coming from the audience, which um, I'm not sure who the best position is positioned to answer this, but just a question on actually where electrolyzer efficiency is right now, and where does it need to go in t to get uh, to get price where we want it. I'm not sure who's got to, got to, going to be able to answer that one. We're, we're, I think we're the world's biggest investor today in electrolyzer technologies through, through some stakes we've been buying in companies. And the electrolyzer is much more of an art than a science because you're trying to balance how expensive it is, i.e. What, what rare material you're using, how long it lasts, how many cycles you can do, mm -hmm. and the efficiency question. And you, it's, it's going to be a constant optimization and trade-off, which is why, as we said, we need to get more university, more research, more, more R&D, more materials in it. Uh, it's right now around 70. Some people are playing with ideas to get to 80. Uh, but the efficiency is not the only issue. The issue is how to balance cost, duration, and efficiency. Mm -hmm. But again, with solar at 10, efficiency is not a concern. Internal combustion engines have 30% efficiency. You know, we can get from solar into, into the uh, wheels of a car at, at better efficiency, however inefficient the, the round trip is. Got it. But I also think that elect using the term electrolyzer is too, um, too generic, right? So I go yeah. back to Varun's point of yeah. there's other technologies to make the molecule, mm -hmm. and that's where uh, this evolution is kind of starting to go. For example, you know, we have an investment in a company that uh, generates hydrogen with microwave plasma reactors. Yeah, so yeah. I, I think we, the, the conversation should get away from electrolysis to what's the most effective way to make the molecule. Power to gas, yeah. yeah. It's about yep. power to X technologies, because yep. it could yep. be power to liquids as well. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if we focus not on specific technologies, but the outcome we want, which is abundant, cheap, clean hydrogen, um, then, then we actually will have better, uh, better chances of getting where we want to end up. Um, and so not just be focused on sort of solar electrolyzers, yeah, it's, et cetera. OK, so uh, Marco's book is called The Hydrogen Revolution. So we're going we're gonna to end with a conversation about, about his book. Um, you know, we, we obviously, we, we've all talked about how hydrogen is crucial for energy transition, um, some of the challenges, some of the opportunities we see. What do we need to do in the next five to 10 years to make Marco's vision a uh, reality? So Marco, you're gonna get to go last uh, and you can summarize your book. Uh, uh, but so let's just go down the line. So Varun, what do you think we need to do to make Mar Marco's vision a reality? I would like to see in the seven sectors that Chad brought up, I would like to see us get to a tipping point. We're not gonna take over the entire market, but in steel to get to that 10% level for a certain set of first movers uh, for aviation, for shipping. You know, we have Amazon on board committing that 10% of its deep sea shipping uh, will be zero carbon, probably using fuels like clean methanol or clean ammonia that use hydrogen as an input. Um, we've worked with the World Economic Forum to create a, a range of these targets for each of these sectors. I'd like to get there in 2030, which will put us on track for net zero by 2050. These numbers are small. They're far smaller than all the other corporate commitments you hear about, but they're the highest impact, highest leverage thing you can do this decade. And that has to be married, as Marco said, with those investments in supply that start right now. If the demand is there this decade, the investments in the projects have to start last year. And that's why we're all gonna have to work together on this panel and, and, and outside uh, with the private sector, public policy, um, and, and the standards, which I think is so important to achieve that future by 2030, where each of these technologies hits a tipping point in the end use sectors we need, such that hydrogen gets to the scale it needs for net zero by 2050. Fantastic. Jill? Uh, I think we need to act now. So Marco covered it. We, we really needed to start years back. And so you can't wait, uh, which entails everything that Varun and everyone else has covered. Um, continue to invest in the, the private sector needs to continue to spend money. And that's, you know, that's kind of counterintuitive, but you have to do that now in order to get there by 2030. Um, and then lastly, I would say, I think the, the standards, and I say standards broadly, not just from setting carbon pricing and doing this in a global um, standard, but also for 
equipment. For example, you know, I'm, I'm out there looking for uh, a Korean certification for the same piece of equipment that has a different certification in India, in the EU, and the US. So um, the standards are gonna be extremely critical. And then lastly, I think we should be thinking about, um, I deem it the nexus of clean. So how clean power, water, food, industrials work together and the combination thereof will help accelerate um, hydrogen. Thank you. I would get all the companies in each one of these sectors, I thought with the seven we're thinking about, but it's not limited to those seven, all down the value chain from the iron ore suppliers to the steel manufacturers to the car companies to the purchasers of cars, and get them in a room sometime in the next six weeks and say, what do we have to have to make this happen? Hard numbers, it's just they're there. Uh, uh, John Kerry could convene one of those meetings. I bet they show up, you know. And th then once they come together and say, here's what we need, and do it in a way it's not an antitrust problem, then see if governments couldn't stand up. So I think if, if the demand signal from companies would be really clear, that gives you something the government to work with, well, can we make that work or not? Mm -hmm. So I, I would I, I say six weeks. There's no reason why we have to delay this meeting. So. Varun, you've got a task, and um, I, you know, Varun just told me beforehand that he's going on his honeymoon uh, in mid-December, so I think that's just been canceled. So, so sorry, um, but you know, we've got work to do. Anything okay. for you, Chad. <laughs> well, look, let, me, let me brag on your boss. I, I mean, I, I think what John Kerry's doing is just fantastic. Yeah, he's, he's met with me as a business leader at DuPont and Shell, so he listens to business quite well. So I really think you have a golden opportunity. You could do it right after your honeymoon, though, if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but you'll, be work, you'll be working during your honeymoon to make the prep work. I, I know how it goes. Okay, Marco, your fi final word. Look, I, I, think we, I think we've said almost everything, if not everything. I, I really think the, uh, Chad, Chad just summed it up beautifully. It's, it's about the next six weeks. We have to get to COP27 with contracts. And so we need to move from PowerPoint and pledges to numbers, the numbers need to have be followed up with contracts, and the contracts will lead to final investment decisions. And if we can get some final investment decisions, we've taken ours with regards to our pipeline, but we need dozens of final investment decisions to, to get to those tipping points that then have a, a waterfall effect. But the book is about two things. It's about how do we get to $1 a kilo or $25 a megawatt hour, but it's also about a pledge to get the energy industry to start talking with the same language. Because right now, we have barrels, we have liters, we have gallons, we have mm -hmm. MCF, we have million British terminal units, we have pence per therm, we have billion cubic meters, we have tons, and we have kilos. And everyone is lost. I've been 20 years in the industry, I still carry around a conversion table. <laughs> so because electricity is going to have the lion's share of the market, whether it's 50, like I think, or, or two-thirds, like Varun said, um, let's just take uh, euros or dollars or yens or... or whatever for megawatt hour. That would really take away so much loss in translation. That would really make our industry a lot simpler to understand. Technology is easier to compare. Policy decisions easier. Trade agreements easier. Because really right now when I open the Financial Times and I read prices in Europe go up to uh, 35 uh, euros per megawatt hour, whilst in the UK they're up to seven pence per therm. And if I don't know <laughs> what, what a pence per therm is, I doubt a lot of other people do because I've been doing yeah. this for 20 years and I'm still confused. <laughs> well, I think that's a call to action. Um, there, I, I, having done some modeling work, uh, trying to, uh, earlier this uh, a couple years ago, trying to model out some of the ener energy transition stuff. <laughs> Same problem, hugely complicated. It never works. So, um, absolutely, the but right the solution purpose. is so easy. Yes, right? the solution is so just, easy. Let's just move so, to the same uh, currency. I, so uh, we'll, we'll work on that, um, and so let's, let's all agree that that's what we need to do. So Marco, thank you so much for being here, for, uh, for your partnership with the Atlanta Council and for this great book. I, I also want to thank Chad, Jill, and Varun. Uh, wonderful for you all to come into the Atlanta Council today. Thank you to our uh, audience here as well as audience uh, out, uh, out in Zoom land. Um, Really, really uh, appreciate the continued engagement from, from our entire group of stakeholders on the hydrogen issue. It's something that we've been working on for a while now, and um, I hope that we will be, continue we, we will be continuing to do so. Um, I want to thank the entire team who helped put this event together, uh, including the team at the Global Energy Center. That includes uh, David Yellen and Amaya Haddup, and then our events and engagement team, uh, Jasper Gilardi, um, Jackson Styron, and Zainab Wirinen. 
So thank you, everybody. Uh, check out the Atlanta Council website for additional uh, programs coming up through the end of the year. And then I hope you all will tune in uh, for our Global Energy Forum uh, this January 15th and 16th. Or if you're so motivated, come uh, to be with us in person in Abu Dhabi again, January 15th and 16th. Thank you so much and have a good rest of your day.